Good morning, everyone. We are live from the Steamboat Church of Christ. It's really good to uh, be here this morning. This is the day when so many Christians around the world celebrate the resurrection of Christ. In, uh, in our tradition, in the Church of Christ, um, we don't generally follow the Lenten calendar. Uh, we don't uh, recognize uh, Easter Sunday as uh, being particularly different from any other Sunday because we celebrate Easter every Sunday. Nevertheless, I know that there will be more people than usual tuned in today because it is Easter Sunday and I welcome all of you. Thank you for being here and God bless you. I pray that uh, our services this morning are a blessing to you. <clears throat> Last week, uh, in our services or after our services, I got some requests from people. Could you post the words uh, to the songs before uh, before you go on so we can sing along? Uh, I'm preparing a, a PDF of our songbook, and I will get that to you uh, if you request it. And then I'll call out the numbers and we'll sing together. <clears throat> For this morning... Uh, please just do your best to sing from memory or just enjoy as we sing here. Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high, hallelujah. Sing ye heavens, thou earth reply, hallelujah. Love's redeeming work is done, hallelujah. Fought the fight, the battle's won. Alleluia. Lo, our sun's eclipse is o'er. Alleluia. Lo, he sets in blood no more. Alleluia. The stone, the watch, the seal, Alleluia. Christ hath burst the gates of hell, Alleluia. Death in vain forbids his rise, Alleluia. Christ hath opened paradise, Alleluia. Lives again our glorious King, Alleluia. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting, Alleluia. Once he died our souls to save, Alleluia. Where's thy victory boasting grave, Alleluia. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious Lord, <clears throat> We bless you, and we praise your name, and we thank you for being the God that you are. You tell us over and over in your word that you are good, and we are so grateful that you are good, that you are good all the time, and that all the time you are good. We're grateful for your love. We're grateful for your favor. 
and those of us who are called and chosen to be saved together with Christ and you, Lord, we are grateful for your chosenness of us. We're grateful to be yours. We're grateful to be called your children. We're grateful that you have given us the power to become children of God. Lord, as we gather this morning and we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, we know that there are many suffering in the world right now that we're up against the wall with this COVID virus. We know, Lord, that many are sick and many are dying. For those who are in you, Lord, for those who are redeemed, for those who are possessed of the grace of Christ, Lord, this is a blessing. For those they leave behind, it is heartache and it is sad and hard and difficult. Lord, we know that many are turning to you during this season who have not turned to you before or have not turned to you recently. And for them, we are grateful. And we pray, Lord, that through this time of stress and struggle, that the harvest will be increased and that your glory will be increased. We thank you, Lord, for being with us this morning. We thank you for being in us. We thank you for inhabiting our praises. We thank you for inhabiting your word. We thank you for inhabiting the Lord's Supper. I pray, Lord, that you will inhabit my message this morning. And that even now, as it goes out over the internet and over the airwaves, that you will wing its way to many a heart that it may find purchase there. Hear our prayer, O Lord, and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still the calm assurance This child can face uncertain days Because he lives Because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives, all fear is gone. 
Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross that river I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he and face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives In 1 Kings 17, 17 through 22, we find the following. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up to the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. 2 Kings 4, 32-35 when Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child, became warm. Then he got up again and walked back and forth in the house once again and went up and stretched himself upon him again. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Second Kings 13, 20 through 21. So Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as the man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood to his feet. Luke 7 11 through 15, soon afterward he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And he drew near to the gate of the town, and behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. 
And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion upon her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, Arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Luke eight forty nine through 55 While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any more. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her to eat. John eleven, thirty-eight through 44 Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen, with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Matthew 27, 51 through 53. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Acts 9, 36-41 now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed and turned to the body and said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. Acts 20, 7 through 12. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, 
and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alive, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and then departed. And they took the young man away, alive. <clears throat> Beloved, according to the Bible, Jesus was not the first person who ever rose from the dead, and he wasn't the last. But there's a distinct difference between what happened when all these other people rose and what happened when Christ rose. To be sure, there are lots of differences, obviously. The raising of these people did not accomplish what the raising of Christ accomplished, but that isn't the point. That isn't what I'm talking about this morning. No, I'm talking about something much more basic, something much more fundamental. Because the raising of all these people, the act itself, the feat itself, what actually happened in that feat, what actually happened in that act, and with and to these people was different from the raising of Christ, not just in some, but also, and more importantly, in substance. Because all the other people in the Bible who were raised from the dead came back from the dead. But Jesus did not come back from the dead. He went forth from the dead. All the other people who rose from the dead went on to lead the lives set out for them on earth. According to rabbinical Midrash, the son of the widow of Zarephath was named Jonah. And he grew up to become a prophet. The prophet Jonah. Now we don't tend to give too much quarter to Jonah. Every lesson you've ever heard about him has to do with either his initial reluctance to go to Nineveh or his bitter disappointment that the people of Nineveh repented. Now, we don't know why Jonah had the disposition that he had. Freud would say that it was because of childhood trauma. I mean, yes, Elijah brought him back to life, but when he came to, what he was greeted with was an old man lying on top of him in his bed. So maybe he had an ingrained distrust of authority. But whatever the cause of his disinclination to trust God's judgment, it is that disinclination that dominates the narrative of his story. However, we almost never hear about the fact that between those bookends, Jonah was a true prophet. He spoke the word of God forthrightly, and the Lord's word did not return to him empty. Jonah 3, 4 through 10, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that he will not perish, so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, 
he relented and did not bring on the, and, and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened after he was raised from the dead by elijah jonah went on to live the life that god had set out for him on earth likewise the son of the shunammite woman which by the way if he and Jonah ever got to swapping stories about comparative trauma that they underwent in being raised from the dead. The son of the Shunammite woman would win because when he came to, when he woke up, he woke up with an old man lying on top of him, naked, hand to hand, eye to eye, mouth to mouth. Now, we know nothing of this boy's disposition toward God after he was raised from the dead, but we do know that at least into his teenage years, he was still alive and was still telling the story of having been dead and having been brought back to life. Second Kings 8, 1 through 6. Now Elisha had said to the woman whose son had been restored to life, Arise and depart with your household and sojourn wherever you can, for the Lord has called you has called for a famine, and it will come upon the land for seven years. So the woman arose and did according to the word of the man of God. She went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And at the end of the seven years, when the woman returned from the land of the Philistines, she went to appeal to the king for her house and her land. Now the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me all the great things that Elisha has done. And while he was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life appealed to the king for her house and her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, here is the woman. And here is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed an official for her, saying, Restore all that was hers, together with all the produce of the fields from the day that she left the land until now. After he was raised from the dead by Elisha, the son of the Shunammite woman went on to live the life that God had set out for him on earth. Likewise, the man brought back to life by the bones of Elisha. Now, in the passage where this incident is recorded, the man in question is not named. But in rabbinical uh, Midrash, he is identified as Shalom, son of Tikvah. And if that's right, then we actually know a little bit about him. Shalom was the son of Tikva and the grandson of Harhas, who was a couture designer and a keeper of the royal wardrobe. And he was married to Huldah, the prophetess whom Josiah and the elders consulted in regard to the discovery of the book of the law, which was found during the renovation of Solomon's temple. Shalom and Huldah lived in the second quarter of Jerusalem, and together they had a son whom they named Hanamel. And this is the same Hanamel who was the uncle of the prophet Jeremiah and who sold Jeremiah the field of dreams, the field that Jeremiah invested in as a sign of hope to the people during the evacuation of Jerusalem. After he was raised from the dead by the bones of Elisha, Shalom went on to live the life that God had set out for him on earth. Likewise, Eutychus. According to church history, Eutychus, who was raised to life after he had died of narcopathic autodefenestration, had been a student of the Apostle John. But, after his encounter with Paul, he asked for permission to go and study with Paul, and John allowed him to go. Eventually, he became an evangelist and turned many Jews and pagans to the Lord and baptized them. He converted pagan temples into churches and endured a great deal of tribulation 
including beatings and imprisonment. After he was raised from the dead by Paul, Eutychus went on to live the life that God had set out for him on earth. Indeed, every revenant of whom there is record in the Bible after having come back to life lived the life that God had set out for them on earth. Everyone, that is, except for Jesus. What's the difference? Jesus didn't come back to life. He went forth to life. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's one more thing that all the people who were ever brought back to life have in common. They all died a second time. You can go today, if you dare, and see the tomb of Jonah in Mosul, Iraq. Likewise, the tomb of Huldah, which almost certainly also contains the remains of her husband, Shalom, is in the Zev Valley near Jerusalem. We do not know the final resting place of the son of the widow of Nain, or of the daughter of Jairus. Nor do we know anything really of those who were jostled from their tombs when Jesus died, except that they came into the city and were reunited with their families after the resurrection of Christ, which does present us with an interesting question, which is, what did they do for the first 36 hours of their lives after their lives were restored? Have you ever wondered about that? I mean, they were wakened from the slumber of death on Friday night at about 6 p.m. when Jesus died. But what then? Maybe they realized it was the Sabbath, and they figured they'd better not walk into town lest the scribes and Pharisees and chief priests accuse them of working. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah, I've been dead. I've seen the other side. I've met the angel of death, I've been in Hades, I've seen the fires of hell, witnessing all the same things that traumatized Lazarus for the rest of his life, but I wouldn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> or maybe they realized it was Passover, and they knew that all their friends and relatives had set out an extra chair for the table at, uh, excuse me, an extra chair at the table for Elijah, lest he should appear. And they don't want to give them all heart attacks by knocking on the door and saying, guess who? <laughs> whatever the case, whatever the reason, they hung out in the cemetery till Sunday morning. Then they threw surprise parties for all of their families. And in the case of Lazarus, we read in John 12, 9 through 11, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Now, in other lessons, I've told you that there is a tradition that this plot was successful, that the chief priest did, in fact, murder Lazarus. Noted scholar Earl Shrook makes a strong case for this conclusion, as do a number of Muslim scholars. However, according to Eastern Orthodox Church history, after the resurrection of Christ, Lazarus was forced to flee Judea because of rumored plots on his life. He fled to Cyprus, where some years later he was appointed the first bishop of Kition by Paul and Barnabas. According to the same tradition, Lazarus was a very somber man. He never smiled after he came back from the dead because he was preoccupied by his memories of the sight of, un of unredeemed souls that he had seen during his four-day stay in Hades. The only exception was one time when he saw someone stealing a pot 
And he said smilingly, the clay steals the clay. And when he came to the end of his life, he died peacefully in Cyprus and was buried there for the second and last time. Either way, after he was raised from the dead by Jesus, Lazarus went on to live the life set out for him on earth. And then he died. And that's so of everybody in the Bible who was ever brought back to life. But it wasn't so for Jesus. Jesus wasn't brought back to life. He was brought forth to life. All these others, when they were raised, were returned to their mortal lives with all of its pain, all of its strife, all of its entropy, all of its finitude, which is to say all of its mortality. But that isn't the promise of Christianity, and no one would want it to be that way. I've never met anyone who has been raised from the dead, but I've met people who have had near-death experiences, and I've read many of their accounts. And among believers, among the elect, among the saved, there is one constant thread that runs through all of their accounts, one theme that recurs every single time in every account, every report, every debriefing, every chronicle of those who have crossed the threshold of death and have come back to life. And that common denominator is this. They didn't want to come back. Bar none, hands down, without exception, to a person, 100% of those who have gone to paradise and have lived to tell about it were extremely reluctant to come back to this life. Now, there are those with a different experience. I have also heard testimony from those who died and went to the threshold of hell, and they were more than happy to come back and take a second go at this mortal life. But among the saved, those who have had a glimpse of what lies ahead don't want to come back to life. They want to go forth to life. That is certainly the testimony of Paul. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. <clears throat> And it is with that experience firmly pressed in his memory that in Philippians 1, 20-25, Paul says, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better for me. But to remain in the flesh is more needful on your account. And to this I yield knowing that this means I will remain here, for I must continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Beloved, the promise of Christianity is not that we will come back to life, but that we will go forth to life, forth to a new life. That's what happened to Jesus when he rose from the dead, and that's what will happen to us when we rise from the dead. As Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 1-5, through 5, 
For we know that if the earthly tabernacle we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile we groan, longing for the day when we will be clothed over with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are so clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tabernacle, we will groan and are burdened, but not because we wish to be unclothed, but rather because we wish to be clothed over with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing this very outcome. And again in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 45, this is how it will be at the resurrection of the dead. The body which is sown is sown in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. For just as surely as there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. As it is written, the first man Adam became a living soul, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And it is with this hope that we celebrate life this morning. Christ did not come back from the dead. He came forth. From the dead. He didn't come back to life. He went forth to life. When Christ arose, he was glorified. Yes, he was still in his body, and it was still his body, but it had been changed. It had been glorified. Now, it was still physical, insofar as that he could be touched and seen and felt and that he could eat, but it was immaterial insofar as he could appear from behind locked doors. This is the bodies with which we will be raised, because Christ's resurrection is a foretype of our resurrection. And it's with that blessing in mind that we will go to the table of the Lord here in just a moment. <clears throat> Though in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the my Lord vainly they watch his bed Jesus my Savior vainly they seal the dead Jesus, my Lord, death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, 
with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ John 6, Jesus says, If you do not eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. But whoever does eat of my flesh and drink of my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. We know that there he was talking about this. He was talking about the Lord's Supper. You know, when Jesus was at the table with his disciples at the Last Supper, he took into his hands bread. And then he blessed it. And that word that's translated blessed, eucharisteo, if translated literally into English, would be gracified. He gracified the bread. And then he said, This is my body. Take and eat. And we believe, and the Apostle Paul teaches us, that every time we bless the Lord's Supper, that it is imbued with grace. In the blessing, the substance of the life substance of Christ enters into this bread so that when we take it into ourselves, we are taking into ourselves the life substance of Christ. The same substance that animated his body. The same substance that glorified his body. And the same substance that will glorify our bodies on the last day. Lord, bless this bread Inhabit it with your grace that we may eat and live. In Jesus' name, by his power, through his grace. Amen. Father, likewise, we thank you for the blood of Christ. We thank you that as we bless this cup, that the life substance of Christ, that the grace in his blood will inhabit this cup, that this cup will take on the life of Christ, that we may drink and live in Jesus' name, by his power, and through his grace. Amen. Now is the time in our service when we also normally take the collection. You know, the, the communion and the collection have always belonged together. As I've told you many times, when Abraham returned from the War of the Nine Kings, he was intercepted on the King's Dale by Melchizedek, who is a type of Christ. And Melchizedek gave him bread and wine 
and Abraham gave him a tenth of all that he had. And from that time, bread, wine, and gifts from the substance of our being have belonged together. We're grateful for the opportunity to give. I know that many of you watching today worship with other congregations in other churches. And I pray that those who feed you spiritually on a regular basis, that you will send your gifts to them. And I just want to remind our members here at the Steamboat Church of Christ that uh, the church still operating uh, depends on your gifts as well. You can find our mailing address on the website. Let's pray as you contemplate your giving. Gracious Lord, thank you for giving to us of your substance. Bless us as we give to you of our substance. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through your spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through the faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may together with all the saints gather the force to prevail in apprehending the whatness, the breadth, and the length, and the height, and the depth, that you might both know the love of Christ which surpasses all understanding and be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to the power that energizes us from within, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host redeemed by blood. They hymned the king in strains divine. I heard the song and strove to join. I heard the song. Hear all who suffered sword or flame for truth or Jesus' lovely name. Shout victory now and hail the Lamb and bow before the great I Am. And bow While everlasting ages roll, eternal love shall feast their soul, and scenes of bliss forever new rise in succession to their view. Rising 
succession to God of hosts on high adored, who like me thy praise should sing, O Almighty King, O God of hosts on high adored, holy, Now, Lord God, as we bring this time to an end, bless us. Let us go out into this world as far as we may go, and in all the ways that we may go, whether that's by telephone or by Facebook or by some other means. But as we go, Lord, May we be salt and light to those around us. And may the beauty of Jesus be seen in us. Hear our prayer, O Lord, and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name, by his power and through his grace. Amen and amen. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Have a blessed week.